Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would first of all like to say thank you to everyone at Awfully History for giving me the opportunity to present here today. I've been so excited and I really am grateful to be here. Uh, I wish to give further thanks to everyone uh, who's here to listen, especially because of the bad weather, and also to those tuning in online. So this paper will essentially provide an overview of my PhD thesis, hence the rather vague and broad title. Uh, so my research looks at various aspects of the mostly Catholic, rural, lower class childhood experience in modern Ireland through a case study of County Donegal from 1850 to 1950. So for the purpose of this paper, some contrast will be provided with County Offaly as well. Sorry, hold on. I think my slides are just not doing what I want them to do. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Uh, so before I continue, I have a few more thank yous to say. Uh, so this research would not have been possible without the support of Offaly History and PH Egan's uh, for the scholarship which I was awarded in 2020 at the beginning of my PhD journey. So I would like to say a huge thank you to everyone at OHAS and Egan's. In particular, I would like to thank Michael Byrne, Morris Egan, Kieran McCabe, Terence Dooley, Parik Siri, Helen Bracken and, Bre and Breda Henry as well. So thank you very much to everyone. Brilliant. So before we get into it, I want to give a brief overview of the paper and the PhD itself. I have adopted a life cycles approach to my study of rural childhood, which first traces aspects of pregnancy, childbirth and infant care in rural Ireland. Then we move on to the lived experiences of children. Here we will discuss the intricacies of work, play and school. Finally, we must consider those who did not survive infancy or childhood, especially as rates of infant and child mortality were high at this time. Um, we will also discuss sickness and ill health and also the matter of illegitimacy and alarmingly high rates of infanticide or infant murder. In terms of defining the age of childhood, this changes over the course of my study period. So for clarity, I am referring to those up until about 16 years of age. The study period of 1850 to 1950 deals with rural Ireland in the aftermath of the famine up until the 1950s, at which point social change and new legislation began to improve the calibre of children's lived experience. I also want to talk briefly about sources at the outset. So throughout my thesis, I have employed various archival documents, folklore, newspaper articles, photographs, and a myriad of other historical sources. I have also chosen to make use of memoirs and autobiographical material, such as some of the texts on the screen here. The use of oral history, whether witness testimony, interview, or self-constructed written memoir are somewhat controversial among historians. The use of Sorry, it is possible that these sources could be somewhat biased in that they may exaggerate or intentionally omit information. It is also possible that the individual could forget key details or misremember an event. However, I tend to focus on the story element of his story, uh, and I think that people's recollections of their lived experience are intrinsic to that. By comparing multiple sources, one can gain an understanding of the wider picture. In this case, the experience of growing up in rural Ireland. Throughout human history, city and country life have been regarded as fundamentally different. Rural Ireland has been understood as a distinct category of Irish life. But how did this come to be? The plantations of Ireland in the 16th and 17th centuries originally led to the creation of a landlord tenant system, which unravelled in the late 19th century following campaigns for agrarian reform. From the 1880s to the 1920s, a series of land purchase acts finally facilitated the purchase of holdings by occupying tenants. As a result, a system of small owner-occupied farms was evident throughout the country. These reparations became linked to national independence and the newly formed Irish Republic, where government officials adopted a certain Republican rurality. This notion of rural fundamentalism emphasised local structures, including family-based farms and agrarian small-town life, as key components of social and political life in Ireland. Self-sufficiency, local wisdom and interactions with the natural environment were held in higher regard than politics or industry. This problematic stereotype of the idyllic rural Ireland has been described as follows. Yeah, no problem. Sorry. To some, rural Ireland may still conjure up an image of a peasant woman of uncertain age fussing around the griddle over an open fire as the hens pick contentedly at morsels of food scattered over the stone floor. The men in the image will be sitting comfortably puffing their pipes. 
an image of peace, of tranquility, of sureness, a life in which the place of each is certain and defined. To this, to some, this is the real rural Ireland, the Ireland of spiritual values, of mystery and of soulfulness. The reality was that everyday life in rural Ireland during this period was one of hardship. This is aptly described in the continuation of the above quote. Such an image is the pure fantasy of literary authors who never experienced the bitter reality of bad housing, no running water, pitifully small farms that never fattened cattle, of forced immigration, of late marriage and social control. So James Hack Took visited Donegal and Connacht in the spring of 1880, highlighting the widespread distress and destitution in these areas. He concluded that local resources, and in particular agriculture, could not sustain such a large population. By the 1920s, conditions for the poor in Donegal had improved little. The families of poor tenant farmers and agricultural labourers lived in a bully, a single-storied thatch cabin made from locally available building materials. A description of a Donegal bully from 1884 indicates that there were floors of mud, roofs of rotten thatch, one wretched chamber often doing duty as a kitchen by day and as a bedroom, pigsty and stable by night, one bed or a truss of straw having often to accommodate the whole family of all ages and both sexes. Uh, and I know a new book has come out by uh, Rachel McKenna on traditional architecture in Offaly, which I've been luckily gifted a copy of, and I'm really looking forward to, to reading that and maybe doing someday a comparison of Offaly and Donegal. The rural peasantry made the most out of what they had. The hearth was a social as well as functional centre of the house. Each member of the household had their own seat around it in order of dignity or importance. The traditional domestic fuels in Ireland were wood and turf on which small quantities of bread and other foods could be quickly cooked. By the turn of the 20th century though, poor Irish families were undernourished and underfed as they subsisted upon nutritionally insufficient diets. When the congested district boards investigated the day-to-day -day life of rural, the rural poor in the 1890s, they discovered that they were consuming high levels of bread and tea while purchasing less often nutritious foodstuffs such as Indian meal, butter, cabbage and meat, which they could not afford. Most houses of the rural peasantry did not have running water or electricity until the 1950s. And that's just a sketch of some of the commonly found household implements. Uh, if I get time at the end, I might come back to this one. Um, so the everyday clothing of the rural Irish population changed little from the mid 19th to the mid 20th century. Yet it was distinctive as it was entirely uninfluenced and unaffected by high fashion. The clothes of the poorer rural classes depended on the availability of local resources and fabrics. Next to the skin, the women wore a shift of flannel or fine linen. They wore a flannel skirt. Bodices were worn either inside or outside of the skirt. Uh, gowns and aprons were sometimes worn over this. Um, a woolen shoulder shawl was worn by folding it in a triangle and placing it over the shoulders and crossing it at the breast. Women also frequently wore headscarves tied under their chin. Although clothes worn by men also reflected the availability of locally produced materials, the great majority wore heavy frieze coats, coarse linen or calico shirts, and corduroy knee breeches. Children, both boys and girls, wore clothes similar to their mothers until the age of 12 for boys and about 16 for girls. Um, the main item of clothing consisted of a one-piece shift dress, um, so it was a mark of advancing manhood when a boy was given his first pair of trousers and older girls eventually donned a two-piece bodice and skirt. Girls frequently went bareheaded, wearing their hair loose or tied back with ribbons. As soon as the young women began to wear the two-piece at around 16, they also, by tradition, combed and pinned their hair up in a bun at the back of their head, like the other older women. The photos here give a good sense of the clothing of the time. Cooperation within the family, among neighbours and within the local community was essential for the survival of poor rural families. Even isolated houses were bound to others by the ties of community, neighbourhood and friendship. Mehel is the Irish word for a work team, gang um, or party and denotes the cooperative labour system in Ireland where groups of neighbours helped each other. This was an important aspect of rural Irish life until the 50s. This custom described by Gray and Hannan as a kinship or community based cooperative work team or network of mutual aid. The neighbours would quote, give you a hand back, particularly with skilled work such as harvesting and threshing wheat. The ways in which farming families worked together were numerous. Another example, a family who owned uh, one horse might join up with another family that owned just one horse and this would create a two horse team. Anne O'Dowd has discussed cooperative labour in rural Ireland in this book that you can see on the slide here. 
So on to the first stage in our life cycle, birth. So during the 19th and up until the mid 20th century, and some may even say after that, Ireland was considered by sociologists to be an extremely patriarchal society. These circumstances were created and maintained by the institutional church, the state, economic structures and the social and cultural constructions of heterosexuality. This was most evident in legal terms in the Irish constitution, written in 1937, which stated, by her life within the home, woman gives to state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. Uh, the state shall therefore endeavour to ensure that mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. There were little available opportunities for women beyond marriage and childbearing. Irish people in the post-famine period did have access to some information about contraception. Uh, while precise quantitative data is lacking, Agnes O'Rourke has found substantial evidence to show that manufacturers advertise contraceptives um, in the Irish national press up until prohibition in 1929. Contraception was outlawed in Ireland in 1935 after the introduction of the Criminal Law Amendment Act. Thus, from the 1930s up until the 1960s, contraception was an underground movement which manifested in the illegal importation of contraceptives. Catholic literature encouraged women to embrace their sacred role as mothers. Rural women, however, were expected to both produce and reproduce by both working the farm and expanding the family. Rural agricultural communities depended on high marital fertility to perpetuate family farms, leading to significant pressure by family and the wider community on married women to become pregnant. To not marry and thus avoid procreation was considered a danger to rural society. Infertility was also stigmatised and often blamed on women. As such, most married women's lives were characterised by cyclical pregnancy, birth and child rearing. The realities of childbirth, however, varied depending on religion and class. Depending on circumstances, Irish women could experience birth and lying in at home, in workhouses, in hospitals or other institutions, including prisons and mother and baby homes. It was not until the 1950s that the majority of Ireland saw a significant movement away from home births to hospital births. So when a pregnant woman was unmarried and her child illegitimate, their experience differed significantly, but I will come back to this in a later section. Rural families were very superstitious about pregnancy, childbirth and infancy. Within oral tradition, fairies stole pregnant women, mothers, infants and midwives and left supernatural imposters in their places. The centuries-old belief remained steadfast in rural Ireland. After childbirth, holy water was sprinkled on the newborn child, all over the room and on the mother to prevent the fairies from taking them. Mothers were advised to rock their infants in a horse's harness or a wrap made from the trousers of the father. Other folktales suggested that anyone who holds the baby should say, God bless to it, so the fairies could not take it. Placing fire tongs over an infant's cradle could also prevent the fairy folk. Other good luck charms included sprinkling urine in the room where the child was born, placing a piece of iron or a cinder in the baby's dress, placing unsalted butter in the baby's mouth and tying a red ribbon across the cradle. After the baby had been born, it was customary for the newborn infant to be bathed in warm salty water, then be wrapped in cocoon-like swaddling bands. Infants remained in close proximity to their mother, though older siblings, particularly sisters, were involved in the care of younger children to the extent that the term little mammies was in widespread use. Almost every household contained a cradle. Cradles of the lower classes were lined with a bed of rushes, a straw mattress and a pillow. Though cradles were relatively cheap and were often fixed and passed down through generations, it is likely that the very poorest of rural families did without them. In some cases, the infant slept on bedding in an empty drawer. Other alternatives were a horse's collar or a tea caddy. Debates on how infants should be fed ensued throughout this period. Medical experts largely believed that breastfeeding was the best, most nutritious form of infant feeding. Uh, in 1877, the medical journal The Lancet published the following. It cannot but be believed that were mothers aware of the magnitude of the evils arising from abstinence of, from nursing, not only to their infants, but to themselves, much less would be heard of the bottle and much more of the natural food, which is the rightful property of the infant, the mother's milk. Artificial feeding with modified milk did though require this, or acquire the seal of approval in the early 20th century. So we're moving on now to the next stage of the life cycle, life itself. So I think uh, I mentioned at the beginning uh, this paper is an overview of my PhD research thus far. 
So I'm currently in the third year of the PhD program and I have one year left. Uh, and this is the final chapter which remains to be researched and written. Uh, I wanted to be transparent with the audience, of course, as education is an essential element of the childhood life cycle, particularly after the introduction of compulsory attendance legislation for Irish school children in 1892 and 1926, respectively. So this is research I hope to undertake in the new year. Um, I'll be looking at records for the primary schools of Donegal, inspectors' reports and teachers' rule books all held at the Donegal County Archive. I also hope to be able to research and write about the industrial school system, although it may be difficult to access some of these uh, records. In any case, I hope to be back in Tullamore again someday to talk to you about experiences of education in rural Ireland. As we've discussed, rural families were traditionally large and children played an essential role in the family economy. This section deals with child seasonal labour and connected to this seasonal migration. This was an integral part of life on the impoverished western seaboard during this period. Hiring fairs and seasonal labour were not unique to the northwest, but particular social and economic circumstances in Donegal allowed the practice of child labour to thrive and to survive longer than elsewhere in Ireland. I was 10 years of age in 1881. The year before had been a bad one for work in Scotland and my father hadn't enough money to pay the rent and the debts. It was the same with the neighbours. A crowd of us were got ready for the hiring fair at Straban. This was the recollection of Paddy the Cope Gallagher. Such was the fate for many of Donegal's children and young people who were taken to hiring fairs in Donegal and border towns throughout Ulster. Boys and girls as young as seven years old were taken, sorry, were hired out to wealthy farm owners seeking labour. If children were chosen to work, their parents would agree to a contract with the farm owner. Rising at dawn and completing chores around the farm and home were, employment, were the employment requirements. Children and young people were also part of the so-called tatty hoking or potato picking gangs who travelled in droves from Donegal to Scotland for the potato picking season. The hiring fairs and tatty hoking gangs continued to attract large numbers of children during the first years of independence and right up until mid-century. It was said that the family purse in thousands of households in Donegal was filled from a number of tiny sources. Teachers noted the severity of child labour and school absence, particularly in Gidor and Clochanili in 1918, as you can see on the slide here. The School Attendance Act came into law in 1926, which stated that all children between the ages of 6 and 14 would have to be in attendance at school every day, except in the case of illness. Any person found guilty of the offence would, be issue, would issue, be issued a fine of £2. The practice of child labour, however, was deeply ingrained in society and parents relied on their money, uh, which the children earned by the hire system. A letter from a father was published in the Dairy Journal in 1927, who said the following. The Act must be modified to meet the special needs or conditions in the Gaeltacht. It will be the means of depriving a poor household of anything from £3 to £15 this year and every succeeding year as well. It is all very well to make parents keep children at school now, but what when winter comes with all its hardships? They will need boots and warm clothing, not to mention payment of the shopkeeper's bills. What is going to be done then? I know it is not with pride that parents take their children away from school. Sheer necessity compels them to do so and nothing else. Those found in breach of the School Attendance Act also faced the courts. At Dunlow Court in May 1928, three boys belonging to Mary Duffy were sent to Killy Beggs Industrial School and her two daughters sent to St Lawrence Industrial School in Sligo. Duffy had not paid fines under the School Attendance Act for the previous year. With the poverty in Donegal at its worst in 1929 and 1930, even the School Attendance Act could not prevent increased exploitation of child labour. The children went in crowds to the hiring fairs and to Scotland. An examination of school rule books for Donegal indicate that hiring out was still a fundamental aspect of family life for the next few decades. Wages were small, but often enough to take back home to cover family expenses. The rate of pay varied depending on a number of factors, including gender, age, skill set, experience type, type of work being done and the demand for work at any given time. Women and girls often earned less despite doing some of the same tasks as men and boys. There were different expectations for each gender. Girls on first entering service would have been expected to have mastered domestic tasks such as cooking, cleaning, looking after younger children and farmyard jobs such as milking and feeding young animals. Newspapers often reported on wages received at the fairs, as you can see here. The prices attained by each group were sometimes followed by the phrase according to capability, meaning that only the most capable servants earn such wages. 
As the majority of child labourers came from very poor backgrounds, it was believed that their standards of comfort and cleanliness were low, and as such, that, that poor accommodation and food would suffice. Barns, byres, stables and lofts, known as bothies, were frequently used to accommodate temporary workers, and they often slept on a wad of hay or straw. This was common within Ireland and Scotland as well. Um, e. O'Gonnell was hired at the hiring fair in Letterkenny in 1867 at the age of 14. His description depicts the loneliness felt by children in such inhospitable surroundings. I was shown my bed. It was made on the ground. Grains of straw, a big bag thrown over the straw instead of a sheet. An old blanket and two more bags thrown over the blanket. That's the bed I had. I went on my knees and I prayed fervently to God. Then I took off my clothes and I went to bed. The bags were very hard on my skin and I wasn't able to sleep. I lay awake then for long enough. I was thinking of home, of my father and of my mother. Patrick McGill in his memoir, uh, Children of the Dead End, he recalled bothies in Scotland. A buyer was prepared for our use and a farm servant was busily engaged in cleaning it out when we came in from the fields. He was shoving the cow dung through a trap door into a vault below. The smell of the place was awful. One blanket apiece was supplied to us by the potato merchant, and by sleeping two in a bed, the extra blanket was made to serve the purpose of a sheet. We managed to make ourselves comfortable by sewing bags together in the form of a coverlet and placing the makeshift quilts over our bodies. But the life was brutal and almost unfit for animals. One night when we were asleep in a barn, the rain came through the roof and flooded the earthen floor to a depth of several inches. Our beds being wet through, we had to rise and stand for the remainder of the night, knee deep in cold water. While widely practiced, child labour was critiqued in anonymous letters in national and local newspapers. An anonymous note published in the Donegal News in 1903 said the following. The hiring season is now on and I regret to have to record that so many of our children are compelled to leave their home and face the hardships and dangers inf incident to hired life in the Lagan and other districts. Little mites varying in age from 8 to 12 years old packed off to the hiring fairs of Straban and Bal Buffet to not be hired but, store but sold. Sorry, I say sold because it is evident be that the parents who expose such children to the dangers already referred to for the sake of a few paltry pounds do not in the least care what happens to these poor helpless children. Less serious risks associated with hiring included wage disputes and the poor housing conditions mentioned above. More serious dangers, however, included the risk of physical, emotional and sexual abuse on young boys and girls. This sometimes led to illegitimate pregnancies for young girls, and I'll come back and talk about this uh, towards the end of the paper. So there was still a limited amount of hiring in Straban and Letterkenny as late as the 1940s, despite the fact that social welfare schemes, including the Children's Allowance, had been established in 1944. Patrick McGill, in his memoir, poignantly summed up this experience. He said, I was merely brought into this world to support those who were responsible for my existence. So despite the continuance of child labour in Donegal anyway, the late 19th century brought about a drastic change in thinking about the child and childhood. From this emerged an alternate image of childhood and the way in which society looked upon children and the function of play in their lives. While many of the chapters in my thesis focus on the inherent unhappiness and unavoidable difficulties faced by children growing up in Ireland, this chapter serves as just one reminder that children had agency, particularly with regards to play. The games children played of their own volition can tell us a lot about culture and how children in the past viewed themselves, each other and the world around them. Thousands of children participated in the Irish Folklore Commission scheme known as the school's folklore collection. Over 50,000 children in their final year of primary school from 5,000 schools in the 26 counties were invited to collect local folklore. Sean O'Sullivan, archivist for the commission, developed a booklet containing guidelines entitled Irish Folklore and Tradition, which was distributed to all the schools. The children wrote down folklore and folk practices gleaned from older people in, the fam in their families or the local community. In the manuscripts, however, we can also find the voices of children themselves as they wrote about their own personal experiences with games, toys and pastimes under headings such as games I play or games we play. So what kind of games were played? Some of the most popular were variations of games played all around the world and throughout history, many of which are still played today. These included hide and seek and blind man's buff. The majority of the most popular games mentioned by the children were games which required only players to play and did not require any props. This indicates a necessary reliance on the imagination 
as poor economic circumstances would have prevented many children from owning shop-bought games and toys. Games in which children assumed adult roles were very popular. The Farmer Wants a Wife is a popular um, singing game teaching about courtship and marriage. The farmer closes his eyes and chooses a wife who joins him in the circle. Little Sally Walker was another game which involved rituals of courtship and marriage. Each child takes a turn to choose another child to love and the remaining children sing verses relating to their courtship, marriage and subsequent childbearing. The Grand Old Duke of York, an adaption of the song The King of France, originates from the early 17th century. In this game, boys and girls get into two lines and march up and down, back and forth in pairs. Other popular games mentioned by the children were associated with particular festivals. Here We Come Gathering Nuts in May was a popular singing game in the month of May. Here the nuts might actually come from the Anglo-Irish word nuts, meaning a bunch of flowers. So bunches of flowers were gathered by children on May Day or La Baltania to decorate the May Pole or to make the May Bush. Other events uh, are celebrated by children through play, including Halloween, Easter and others. At Halloween, many games are cited, such as Catch the Apple, Ducking for Apples and Nutcracking. The making of turnip lanterns, so kind of the Irish version of modern day pumpkin carving, is also described by many children. Games which deal with death and burial, such as Jenny Jones, Green Gravel and Old Roger is Dead, are also popular within this collection. Historians have found that such games were obsolete outside of Ireland by the 1950s, but continue to be pop popular here. This may be a result of steadfast Irish traditions of death and burial. Regional variations in games played are evident in the collection. It is interesting to note that a game called Glasgow Ships Are Sailing Down, which is a wordplay on London Bridge is falling down, is only found in County Donegal in this collection, highlighting the close relationship of the county with Scotland. On the other hand, London Bridge is falling down can be found in numerous counties throughout Ireland in the collection. Another child cites the game How Many Miles to Dublin, which was a version of How Many Miles to Babylon. Again, this highlights the physical and metaphorical distance between Donegal and Dublin. Similarly, this game is not described by any other uh, children from any other county in Ireland. In Offaly, one finds a game called Bullagoo described by children. I've not found this game described anywhere else uh, except for Offaly, so maybe if anyone here knows anything about that, they might let me know at the end. Evidence for toy play was found among the manuscripts, although much less frequently. Um, among the most popular toys were mentioned in, that were mentioned in the school's collection were marbles, spinning tops and dolls. Board and table games were also mentioned, including snakes and ladders, ludo, drafts and cards. The other popular category were toy guns, catapults and bow and arrows. The children of the poorest families often made toys from materials readily available to them. Their ingenuity is evident where the children describe turning a spool of thread into a top, moulding a short thick stick into a toy gun and shaping ash branches into bows and arrows. They also used items which were discarded from the domestic environment such as bottles or boxes and even the modern water which could be found all around. During this time, uh, perceptions and anxieties around masculinity dom dominated discourses about Irish boys and their play. Boys' play and physical culture would produce a strong body and a strong mind. On the other hand, the image of the ideal Irish girl and her role within the domestic sphere is reflected in their play. There was an expectation that girls were to be trained instead for their role as future mothers and wives. Advertisements for girls' toys included a cookery set, tea set, baby doll bathing set, a loom, a sewing box, various types of dolls and prams. Whereas mechanical toys, train sets and model bridges were marketed exclusively to boys. The design and engineering activities associated with model building was associated with masculinity. By the mid 20th century, sport and physical culture was still not inclusive of the on the grounds of gender. In the late 1940s, County Donegal was considered to be the quote, last masculine stronghold in Ireland in terms of sport and recreation. An article in the Donegal News in 1949 stated that Donegal was a place whose social activities are primarily designated for men only and where the female of this species can hardly get a look in. I'm quoting the article here. Old traditions die hard in this part of Chirconnell. The place for women and girls is in the home among the pots and pans. Social activities should be the preserve of the men folk alone. Young ladies were encouraged to join social clubs as, and again I quote, they cannot very well join up in the ranks of the FCA or start football clubs or female angling associations. After all, wouldn't they like to be called ladies, not Amazons, she-men or tomboys? 
Children were well aware of these expectations and the school's collection highlights the way in which they perceived gender and how they modified and transgressed gender norms through different games. The majority of the children who mention gender do indicate that boys and girls play different games and these are often listed. A list compi compiled by a child at Esker School in County Offaly even stated that girls play house while boys play an array of sport. An Irish speaking child in Donegal said the following Nihi and Kinalkina Kahivamshri Atag Nagasri is Atag Nagursri, which translates as the same types of games are not played by boys and girls. Another child wrote that girls and boys do not play the same games and inferred that girls do not play rough games, such as football, that the boys play. However, another child disputes this completely by saying the following. In this district, many of the girls play the same games as the boys. They are to be seen playing football with the boys, and even in some instances, they can play better than some of the boys. In this way, we can see that children were aware of the gender norms imposed on them as boys and girls, but that they sometimes chose to antagonize this by playing games and toys that were supposedly more suitable for their gendered counterpart. So unfortunately, we've reached the last stage in the life cycle, death which was a very common reality due to high infant and child mortality in Ireland during this period. At the beginning of the 20th century, infectious diseases were the principal causes of death for males and females of all ages in Ireland. Such in illnesses were intrinsically linked to poor living conditions and inadequate diet. Access to medical care varied depending on a range of factors, including class, religion, and even geographical proximity of patients to dispensary depots. Nurses and medical officers' accounts show that they travelled by horse and bicycle, even by boat, to offshore islands on the western coast. The lack of ease of access to medical care may have been the leading cause for the continuance of folk medical practice in rural areas, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. Ireland during this period had an extremely high infant mortality rate, especially among illegitimate babies. In 1930, one illegitimate child in four died in the first year of life. The infant mortality rate of illegitimate children remained disturbingly high up until 1950, at almost double that of legitimate children. In 19th and early 20th century Ireland, the rural countryside was generally much healthier than urban areas, such as cities and large towns, because of lower rates of infectious disease and illness associated with dirt, disease and contaminated food. According to Mary Daly, the comparative advantage of rural over urban areas in Ireland was long lasting. Those born in poor areas along the western seaboard, however, were more likely to be nutritionally deficient with high instances of vitamin A deficiency. You can see here that infant mortality was generally lower in County Donegal than the national average. Infant mortality was, was a difficult and complex problem with several causes, not all of which were fully understood. By the 1930s, however, infant mortality was deemed to be both preventable and non-preventable. It was believed that deaths in the first month from developmental disease were due to inherited weakness rather than any other factor. More generally, high infant mortality rates were blamed on poverty in the home, particularly poor standards of personal hygiene. Many infectious diseases which claimed the lives of, of, of infants were largely attributable to poor living standards, including tuberculosis, diphtheria and tetanus. Outbreaks of diseases affecting children often made the local news, regional news and even national news, um, such as here in the Irish Independent in 1935. I quote, The Scarlatina outbreak in Donegal continues unabated. The local fever hospital is full, 10 cases being from Letterkenny alone. The schools remain closed. So as mentioned above, difficulties in accessing official medical care left many in rural Ireland reliant on folk medicine and unregistered medical practitioners. In County Donegal, cures were still prevalent up until the mid-20th century, and much later in some communities. The evidence demonstrates that the use of folk medicine may also have been a result of cultural preference and a certain distrust of official medical practitioners. The sometimes reluctance to pay heed to the advice of medical officials is evident in one folktale collected. People do not believe in doctor's cures for every disease they have. They get most of the cures from the herbs that are found in the fields and in the ditches. Another folktale says the following. The country people and the old people are great believers in old cures. The school's collection showcases a number of cures for illnesses which commonly affected infants, including whooping cough, diphtheria, ringworm and measles. The cure for ringworm is to boil a mouse's flesh and to rub it on the spot. There is a cure in briars to keep away the whooping cough. It is to cut them and boil them and put them on one's throat. 
The cure for the measles is to wind the thread off a spool and put it around the spot. The cure of the diphtheria is to take a drink of water that would be under a rock. That one's quite vague. A cure for the measles is to get a big red worm and rub it up and down three times a day until the worm withers. When the worm begins to wither, the measles begin to wither also. For tuberculosis, the cure for consumption is to go out in the early morning and gather snails to roast them and eat them. Yet another supposed cure for tuberculosis was to drink the blood of a pig. Another describes how to cure mumps, which was to roast the hind quarter of a mouse, then grind it into a powder and eat it. <laughs> To get rid of whooping cough, you can cure a child who having the whooping cough by leaving a donkey eating oatmeal, then by putting the child out and in under him three times. So more cures, cures for whooping cough are shown here on the slide, and these were provided by a Mr. Daly from Alderborough and County Offaly. So he has a few different ones there as well. So as alluded to throughout the paper, uh, the experience of illegitimate children differed vastly from legitimate children. It began with the mother. When a pregnant woman was unmarried, her experience differed significantly. For these women, the ideal of becoming the good, married, Catholic mother remained out of reach, as did the networks of community support available to married women. Extramarital pregnancy was viewed as the antithesis of respectable behaviour. Attitudes towards illegitimacy were shaped by societal issues about marriage, inheritance, emigration and authority within the family. Lindsay Erner Byrne suggested that the very existence of unmarried mothers and their children violated all understandings of family and morality. Single women who became pregnant faced few options. For many women, entering an institution or being institutionalised was the only solution. In the 19th and into the 20th century, the majority of unmarried mothers gave birth in the workhouse. This architecture of containment uh, continued with the establishment of the Irish Free State, a phrase which James Smith coined when re referencing the mother and baby homes, industrial and reformatory schools, mental asylums, adoption agencies and Magdalen laundries, in which unmarried mothers, illegitimate children and orphans were incarcerated. Smith argues that these institutions were shrouded in a web of secrecy and denial and were punitive rather than rehabilitative. Some were owned and run by local health authorities. This includes all of the county homes and also some of the mother and baby homes. Other institutions were owned and run by religious orders, such as the Legion of Mary and the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus. A recent very controversial report by the Commission of Investigation into Mother and Baby Homes, published in 2020, found very high infant mortality in these institutions. For my research, I undertook a case study of the Stranorler County Home in County Donegal, which was the mother and baby home. So 1,630 single pregnant women were admitted to Stranorler between 1924 and 1962. The youngest maternity admission was just 13 years of age. The registers show that 99.8% of the women admitted gave a home address in Donegal. The others came from Sligo, Tyrone, Derry, Cork and Antrim. Over 99% were employed as domestic servants, and we've already seen how impactful that um, instance of child labour was in the county. Other occupations included factory workers and shop workers. 98% of the single mothers were Roman Catholic, and the others were either Church of Ireland or Presbyterian. The living conditions in the county home were poor. In the early 1920s, the institution was overcrowded, and the healthcare facilities in the county homes were primitive. Sanitation and water supplies were not adequate, and the home only had two flush toilets. Most residents used toilets outside of the building that were described as revolting. There was no hot water available in the operating theatre, and as a result, there were many outbreaks of typhoid. A 1940s inspector noted that there were no water facilities for bathing children, and it was not until 1949 that improvements began in this institution. Uh, and when they eventually did, they installed um, bathing and sanitary facilities in the children's ward and a much needed wash basin in the maternity ward. So 1,777 illegitimate children were either born in or admitted to Stranorler during this time. 57% were discharged with their mothers and are regarded, recorded as having gone with her to the family home. The commission argued that many of these children likely went on to be privately nursed in the community. 10% of illegitimate children were transferred to another institution. The Sisters of Mercy in the Stranorler County Home had an unofficial arrangement with the Sisters of Nazareth, who ran the Nazareth homes in Derry and Belfast, and also St Murrah's Orphanage, which was in Fawn, also in County Donegal. 
From here, they may have been nursed out, boarded out or adopted. And we won't get into the legal versus illegal adoption uh, discussion today. Um, so these institutions did receive some state funding and the Department of Local Government and Public Health and local health authorities also provided funding for the boarding out and adoption of children. During its period of organisation, one in five children born in or admitted to Stranorlar died there. 343 illegitimate children died in the home, either in infancy or early childhood. 87% of deaths occurred in infants less than one year old. Of these, 17% were less than a week old. The death rate in the county home peaked in 1930 with an illegitimate um, infant mortality rate of 42%. At least two of every five children born in or admitted to Stranorlar in 1930 died. So the burial ground at the Stranorlar home was the original workhouse burial ground. The, the, the home itself was a workhouse before, um, which is located north of the main building. The records show that the old burial ground boasted shallow graves and that bodies were buried in an ad hoc manner. By 1939, the storekeeper noted that the burial ground was overcrowded and required extension. In 1945, the storekeeper noted a number of complaints about the graveyard, which was apparently in a wretched state. By 1948, the graveyard was overcrowded and graves overlapping, which eventually led to an incident where a grave digger split a coffin while digging a grave. A new burial ground was um, built in 1949 and the first burial in 1950. Both burial grounds are now within the fairways of Stranorlar and Balbafay Golf Club, which you can see on the Google Maps images here. So this is where the 343 illegitimate children are buried in unmarked graves. So some pregnant single women managed to avoid being institutionalised and were able to conceal their illegitimate pregnancy. Out of fear and shame, many married mothers, unmarried mothers uh, during this period, 1850 to 1950, resorted to infanticide or the killing of an infant. Cleena Rattigan noted that in Ireland and in rural Ireland in particular, the police pursued and investigated rumours about unmarried women suspected of having killed an infant or concealed its birth. There appears to have been little sympathy for single women who became pregnant outside of wedlock. Rural communities did not support such women. Instead, they informed on them. In doing so, they made clear about, about their intolerance of such behaviour. Rattigan and also Elaine Farrell have shown that significant numbers of women were charged with infanticide and concealment of birth from 1850 to 1950 around Ireland. So I wondered then about the women who committed such crimes but were never actually caught. So I found for the period 1870 to 1950, a large number of unidentified babies with no known parent had been registered as deceased in Donegal. So 350 unidentified deaths were recorded in total in Donegal. Of these records, 162 of them were infants and had a suspicious death in that there was an inquest held by the local coroner. The most common cause of death was um, in 47 cases neglect or similarly phrased as want of proper care or improper attention at birth. The second highest with 31 deaths was just unknown, likewise phrased as not ascertained or insufficient evidence. And third highest with 20 was hemorrhage or death from not tying the umbilical cord. Similar cases remain undetected or unsolved because the body was never discovered on the rural Irish landscape and the, per the perpetrator successfully concealed their pregnancy. So how many bodies were never discovered? How many suspects were never caught? Because nobody could report the disappearance of an infant they did not know had been born. Illegitimate children were not afforded the same burials as legitimate children, as is highlighted by the Stranorlar case study. In local communities, unbaptized and or illegitimate infants were often buried in unmarked graves at sites known as Killini. And this is one example from the Rosses in Donegal, uh, Ilan Namaru or Island of the Dead, where the unbaptized children were buried. It's important to note also that the legal status of illegitimacy survived in Ireland until 1987. So to conclude, I would just like to reiterate the ups and downs of growing up in rural Ireland. The life cycle of children depended on a number of factors, including class, gender, religion, wealth. And while similarities can be drawn across the set of experiences, the life cycle was particular on an individual level. Childhood came with a number of adversities, as we have documented, and not all made it to adulthood. Despite the difficulties associated with childhood in rural Ireland during this period, children and their families made the most of what little they had. Thank you all for listening.
thank you very much, Megan. Uh, we'll now take some questions. Uh, would you please put up your hand and I'll take the microphone to you. I was just wondering about churching. Uh, <laughs> you know about churching? Yes, I do indeed. Because uh, I can remember my younger sister being churched. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So yeah. that's not too long ago, not you know? Not at all. Not at all. And I have, um, so again, this is all a summary of everything. But within the wider chapter, I have discussed a bit more of the impacts on women. And churching is very much um, still in living memory. Like my own sure. grandmother was churched as well. Um, but it just highlights the shame that even women who were married and pregnant were still shameful in the eyes of the church and this act of churching where you had to be cleansed to kind of re-enter society uh, was very very common and it's despicable that it went on as long as it did but it just highlights that even the married female body while pregnant was considered um, sinful in some way uh, to the church in the eyes of the church yeah Thanks, Megan, for that. That was Thanks. excellent. Thanks very um, much. Just a couple of things I want to just ask you. Yeah. Um, the first one is on infanticide. Yeah. Any evidence there of postnatal depression? Of course, it was undiagnosed at this stage, but I'm just wondering, did, would that have played a role? And I have looked a little bit at the lunatic asylum in Donegal, the records for there, and you see a lot of women being, um, in, I would say, interred after pregnancy there, but they didn't have actual technical terms that we would have today, mm. like postnatal depression. Mm. They didn't understand that. But they would say, you know, psychosis post-pregnancy or, or similar things to that. Um, and I'm not sure if they really understood if they were directly related or not, or if they felt that it was probably not, yeah. a coincidence. I don't think that they did. Um, but I'm sure a lot of these cases of infanticide may be attributable to that, but it's really hard to be able to circumpose that now, I suppose, looking back at the evidence. Um, but I think if they knew what we knew now, we would think about it in a slightly different light. So not only did they have to deal with, you know, the the societal shame of the the pregnancy there may have been also cases where women were mentally ill or had postnatal depression following birth and wanted to um get rid of their their child following that so that's a really really interesting point and i know there's a a scholar called kira henderson in trinity and she's doing a study of kind of postnatal de depression and infant loss as well um and she's in the middle of her phd now so she would know a little bit about that as well if anyone's interested okay. just the other aspect thanks for that um, yeah. children let's say with intellectual difficulties or let's say physical disabilities mm -hmm. have was that much was it probably probably not well probably not paid it for the proper attention obviously but did you have you come across that a little bit so far so i think i might see a bit more of that in the school side of the education side of things but i've seen it a little bit in the infanticide um area of study where sometimes if a child was born with a physical disability they would have felt that the fairies had somehow interfered with the pregnant woman and cursed the child and that may have been another reason for killing the infant um so that's a particularly harsh example of where i've seen that um and just again this idea of you know, if a child had any kind of uh, physical or, or mental disability, it was deemed that it was a curse by the fairies in some way. Uh, even if they did um, live with that, then it was always, oh, you know, the fairies got to him when he was a baby or whatever. Yeah. And just lastly, then, yep. which, you had a fairway there of a golf course. Is, is, is that an actual fairway? I mean, it's actually, it is. Yep. So um, I'll put it back if I can. Is that still been played upon? Like, is it, it is, yeah. So well, it's an unmarked grave? It's completely unmarked. Uh, oh, I think it's despicable. I don't know if oh, I can that's, that's put it back now. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, it might not come up, but the fact that there's been no archaeological survey done, as far as you can see, there there seems to be like a small wall built around the site just to mark off the actual grave site itself. But there's no signs. There's nothing to show what it is. And also, I, I had to take out some words because I know I'm a bit over time anyway. But um, post-1950, when they moved into the, the new graveyard, um, there were no evidence for children being buried in the new graveyard, but 100 and I think 87 ch children died after 1950 and there's no evidence for where they're buried. So it's assumed that they may have actually went back in and stuck them in the old graveyard, which was completely full and ad hoc burials each which way, because there's no evidence for those 187 in the new graveyard. So uh, the report that I mentioned was quite controversial. They kind of suggested that it's possible they were buried in private graves, but that's not entirely likely, I think, in, in my opinion. But um, I would love to see eventually maybe some archaeological survey done 
to prove and to show where they are or excavation even but i don't know if that'll happen it might but yeah mm. Uh, Megan, I just want to compliment you on your excellent uh, lecture there. Thank you. Ben. Illuminating that for most of us probably would be an area that we wouldn't be that familiar. Mm -hmm. And a few of the phrases you use there about superstition around childbirth mm -hmm. and that, I, I wouldn't say that would have been exclusive uh, to Ireland, but uh, that phrase swaddling bands mm -hmm. is the first time I've, I've ever heard it. Mm -hmm. And the area of child labour, uh, that was common right up well up into the 1960s in yeah. Ireland, in most places. Mm -hmm. And the percentages you quoted there about the w women that were discharged from the mother and baby home, mm -hmm. I I'd say that probably goes against the modern perception that a lot of the women were incarcerated for, you know, many years. Yeah, yeah. I, I was rather surprised at, uh, yeah. at that figure. Yeah, yeah and it, there has been some argument as well that the figures may not be entirely accurate because the commission that wrote the report only had scant available information to them when they were writing the report and also there was a bit of a controversy in that um they, were, they came out and said after the report was published that they did not include the evidence found from witness testimony so they're only really going by what figures that they have on record on paper which as we know may not tell the full story so that is kind of unambiguous enough um, but there's lots of reports of women you know after that also having been sent to the magdalen laundry in Derry, there's a huge number of movement from stranorla to Derry, um which is something again i discussed in the, the larger chapter but i didn't get time to talk about today but it's a really sad state of affairs and i i do think it's important to draw attention to the county homes as well as the mother and baby homes i think we kind of we think about you and we think about the mother and baby homes sometimes we forget about the county homes but it was the exact same state of affairs in, in those kind of institutions as well even though it wasn't just mothers and babies there were also um people with disabilities or elderly people that were in these institutions and the mothers in some cases the unmarried mothers actually took care of of the people in the institution so it was it was very hard very hard life That last point you make was very much the case here in Tullamore, mm. where unmarried mothers were acting as nurses, yeah. with going around with their children and assisting more elderly wow. patients yeah. in yeah. the 1890s. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how long further it yeah. carried on, but yeah. the other thing I wanted to ask you was the impact of the death rate on local authorities in Donegal, did it make any impact or was it taken as a matter of course or? It was kind of taken as a matter of course and again often and I did look a little bit at um, Board of Health records where they discuss this but it's nearly always blamed on the family themselves if children are dying and infants are dying they're blaming the mother for not breastfeeding they're blaming usually the mother for an uncleanly home environment so they kind of pass the buck in a way back to the family back to the mother rather than trying to take any responsibility and make any major change in terms of the environment that these infants and children were born into and could i ask you one more thing that yeah. was the boarding out mm -hmm. was there any uh, correlation between that and the hiring fairs yeah, absolutely so in an unofficial sense absolutely we i've seen documents describing more so in cases of disputes where we see evidence for this that um children were then being abused by the person that had hired them out because they're overworking them so there was kind of unofficial arrangements made where people would board out the children but they were working for them um they wouldn't obviously earn anything because they were earning their keep as such so that was entirely in kind of an unofficial arrangement but it's it's incredibly it's incredibly hard and you do see that correlation with the hiring fairs and with the hired labor as well but yeah it's a it's a sad instance of of affairs so both legitimate and illegitimate children were involved in the hiring out uh, no one no one escaped that one unfortunately yeah thanks I... were the hiring fairs just in mayo and donegal you i don't hear about them down here maybe yeah. they were no they took place around towns throughout ireland but i did a little bit of mm. research before coming here and i was talking to the guys earlier about 
I didn't find any real evidence for anything like that in the Midlands or in Offaly. But I do, I am aware that people would have had unofficial arrangements in terms of there may not have been a fair as such, but people would have went to a particular spot in the town and stood and waited to see if a farmer would come along and hire them or they would walk around the local farms and ask if they needed help just by word of mouth. So it could have taken place in that way as well, mm. but I just haven't found as much evidence for it. So, And I'm wondering, did people say around Offaly, did they go tatty? picking to Scotland. They didn't. Sure they didn't. I, I'm not sure. No. I haven't heard too too much of it, but mm. it's possible that some did or or maybe elsewhere as well. And I know they did it in, also in England, but Johnny Gall had the big connection with Scotland, so that was why I focused on that one. Um, I have an online question here yes. as well. What was the one thing you found in as part of your research to date that surprised you the most? Definitely. So in the vein of the hiring fair again, um, I think in modern terms, we very much see it as cruel and hard and they shouldn't have had to do it. They were too young. They were children. But um, the evidence that I found from reading a couple of kind of biographical memoir sources was that children, particularly young boys, actually seen it as kind of like a rite of passage or nearly coming into the, their own, coming into manhood by being finally of the age where they would go to be hired or go off to Scotland to do the potato picking with you know, their older brothers or their cousins or their local community, they, they seen that as a rite of passage and they were almost excited, some of them, to go. Um, although I think that was quite short lived when they, they got there and they seen how hard and difficult it was. But there was that sense of pride in that they were getting older and also providing for their families. So that really surprised me because with all of this, um, we have very modern perceptions of what childhood should look like. And a lot of this is completely, completely antagonizes that. So it's hard to reconcile, but that was definitely the thing that surprised me the most. So thanks for that question. I just, uh, on the question of churching, yes. I'm the eldest of a large family. And I remember the younger members of my family being born. Mm -hmm. And my mother considered, we all considered that it was the blessing of the mother mm -hmm. and her baby. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't heard the yeah. other connotations. Yeah, I suppose it depended. People were very religious and people saw it as, you know, socially and religiously appropriate. But um, it then, as time went on, I think people began to regard it in a different light. But I think if you actually look at the stipulations by the church, it was technically a cleansing before the the, the person was allowed to re-enter the church. Yeah. So in often many cases, a mother wouldn't have been allowed to attend the baptism if she hadn't been churched yet. So she wasn't allowed to set foot in the church. So this is where that kind of negative perception comes from, I suppose. And the other thing is that the babies were, uh, I know the younger members of my family, were baptised before my mother came home from hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was the usual at the time, yeah, I think. Yeah, very much so. Because it was a fear that the baby might die. Yeah, so they wanted, so, yeah, and they didn't want to have to bury them in a colleen. So right. it was to get them baptised as soon as possible. Even if a child was very sick, they would have baptised them immediately, yeah. We'll take one yep. more and then. Yeah, I, I just want to, I heard this one out when I was young and I heard it described it as a Thanksgiving for the safe delivery of mother and baby. Mm, the church, you're talking about the church yes, again. Yes, I, I yeah, heard it described yeah. in that way. And I think that's the real spirit of the mm. what it was yeah, yeah. In, in that sense. Yeah, it's hard to know um, what ever people perceived versus what the, the scripture says. Um, but it all changed then after I think Vatican II, it all, um, it all changed then. But yeah, it's an interesting point, more so for the, the woman's experience, the mother's experience than I suppose the child themselves. But yeah, very, I think Ireland in particular has really particular rules around birth, baptism, and then obviously death as well. And, and the rituals with that, we have a very particular culture of that here. So it manifests itself in this way. Thank you. I'll now call on Frank Brennan to make uh, the vote of thanks. Oh, thank you, Megan, uh, for that very informative talk. Uh, and uh, uh, it brought back a lot of memories to me uh, personally because I've always had an interest in this aspect of history. Because, as you know, when we were, well, you might know, but you're younger than we are. When we were going to school, it was chronology and the battle of this and the battle of that. But we never got an inkling into what everyday life is. Apart from my grandmother used to tell us stories. She was born in 1881. And she fed us with stories as, as as young lads. And I've always had an interest in this part, this type of 
everyday life, which is real history. Yeah. And when I was teaching, uh, the, ki the children always loved this aspect. Mm -hmm. And it's good to see that it's been included a lot more in curriculum today. And uh, you're talking there about cures. Yeah. Uh, lots of, there's lots of people around here with great cures. But one of the cures, anyway, we heard was uh, if you were going bald, to rub an onion into your head. <laughs> But it didn't seem to work with me anyway. So uh, i just like to wish you the best and every success in your thesis. And hopefully when you come back here, you'll be a doctor, <laughs> Megan. Thank you very much. And, and uh, we'll be looking forward to your next talk on education. Absolutely. Thank you Thank very you much, so much. and you. every Thank success. You. Thank you. Uh, I just want to second that photo, thanks. And to mention that... Uh, it was great to see you after the three years, because as you know, the scholarship from Egan's Whiskey of Tullamore was awarded in 2020, uh, but we didn't get a chance to meet Megan at that time because of the COVID in our last year. So this year, even with the fog, we decided definitely we were going to have this evening. So it worked very well, and thanks to to that new uh, new program, the the online lecture. Mm -hmm we've been able to access quite a number of people who were not able to attend. So if you're sitting at home now and you feel you've done very well, I can recommend to you a warm whiskey from Egan's of Tullamore. <laughs> and uh, not you now, because you have a lot of work to do yet. <laughs> and uh, you have another year. But when you come back again as, as a doctor <laughs> of history, we will certainly celebrate. Brilliant. <laughs> and thank you very much for all you've done. And your work is terribly interesting. And we're really looking forward to seeing another talk from you at a later date. And, of course, the inevitable monograph, <laughs> which is well worth having when I listened to what I heard tonight, when I enjoyed it very much. So, look, at all the best in your studies and uh, congratulations on everything you've been Thank doing. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.